Hello, and welcome to the Dorkland Roundtable. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Elton of the Dorkland Blog, and tonight my guest is Steve Kenzen of a lot of games. <laughs> hey, Dorklanders. <laughs> um, we'll start this out. Uh, I have the, the fairly standard uh, opening, and I think when you were on the, the, the superhero designer roundtable, um, I did sort of a variation of it, but... Um, what uh, for you? What what was the game that got you started uh, as a kid? Down I had my start in RPGs with the first edition gray boxed set of Gamma World. Um, I came across it in a Hallmark store um, uh, that was selling you know books uh, and at the time RPGs uh, and begged my parents to buy it for me, and um, they, they did, which I, I suspect they regretted ever since. Um, and yeah, I, I basically spent um, most of my, um, you know, eighth grade um, convincing my friends to, to roll up weird mutants um, with me and, and uh, um, play Gamma World, so... Uh, we started out with that, and we played pretty much every Gamma World adventure there was at the time, all three of them. Um, and um, then we made up a few things of our own, and then we decided that we were out of things to do with Gamma World, and one of our characters encountered a dimensional portal, and our characters jumped the fence to Greyhawk, and our Gamma World characters romp through Greyhawk for quite a while. So in that, in that, in that cool way that, that only the very young could run a role-playing game back then. Oh, yeah, yeah. Totally, you know, without any self-awareness <laughs> of it at all. <laughs> and, you know, um, th those days, I remember, like, seeing, you know, D&D stuff at gas stations and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like you said, card shops. It was, it was just, you know, really cool... You, because you would find like it, it was never it was usually not anything that made sense. It would be like three modules, or you know, it, it was yeah, it, it was it was never you know like they had the core book or something or a box, I should say, back then. Right. But it was it was always. I remember there there was a um, and this is this is going to date me, and I, I will probably have to explain it after I say it. But when I was a kid, when I used to stay with my grandparents. There was a dime store in, in their in the town where they lived. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time, the Dime Store had five copies of the old D&D module Dungeon Land. And that was it. That was the only mm -hmm. gaming stuff I ever saw there. Yep. Yeah, for, 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 those, for those who are young and don't know, Dime Stores were, I guess, what we would have called a convenience store now. But with, with, with less slush. It was kind of like a scaled-down uh, department store. But Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, well, my my first encounter with with D and D was finding a lone copy of um, Deities and Demigods at a bookstore with completely out of context, no other D and D books around, and I was a big mythology buff uh, as a kid, um, so I was really interested in it, but I couldn't understand what all the numbers were for. Uh, I was like, oh, there's all these write-ups of all these deities and all these different mythologies, but I'm like, I don't understand what all the the blocks of numbers are for. And what does all that stuff mean? So I ended up, you know, putting it back, and it wasn't until some time later that I realized that it was it was actually a game book. Hmm. Yeah, you know, and that, that's something I think particularly um, of a, a generational thing. I think a lot of that, that's one point of commonality with a lot of older gamers or gamers who who you know came in earlier than others. I mm -hmm. sound older, but is that is that sort of common interest in in mythology that, mm. that drew yeah. us to a lot of these things. Mythology, you know, comic books, which is, right. uh, you know, I, comics are kind of the modern mythology, I guess, as, as some say. So, yeah. Um, now, what um, what uh, sort of led you along the, the path after those initial things that, that kind of transitioned you f into uh, eventually wanting to go, uh, I'm going to write for every game line that is uh, published? <laughs> well, the, the writing for lots of games 
you know, comes from being a freelancer. Yeah. Uh, you know, you you want if you're you're going to work freelance, um, and, you know, you you take your work where you can get it, um, and you know, you you look for work anywhere you can find it. So, um, when I, once I had done uh, a few things uh, for FASA when I originally got my start writing for Shadowrun. Um, and decided I was going to make a go of it, you know, doing it full time. I started casting my net pretty wide, and you know, I would, uh, you know, talk to game. To, you know, if it was a game I was at all interested in, I would, I would seek out the developer and I would talk to them, and I would, you know, give them my resume and my contact info and say, hey, you know, I'm available. I'm, you know, looking for work. Um, so, you know, I always tried to make sure that my work calendar was full of different projects. Uh, to do so, you know, a lot of it really wasn't setting out so much to write for as many games as I did. It was just, you know, I, I you know, I had to make a living, and yeah. so you, know, it's, you look back on it, in, you know, ten, fifteen years, and you're like, wow, that's a lot of stuff. Yeah, <coughs> um, I, I first came across your writing when you were doing the stuff for GURPS Third Edition. I was oh, a wow, huge, yeah. I was a huge fan of, of GURPS back when I had. A lot more free time and willingness to do a lot of math. Right. I mean, not. To, I mean, I I don't want to knock GURPS because I mean I spent probably a good fifteen, maybe twenty years playing various editions of GURPS. It it, it, it can be a very fun game. It's and, a very solid system. Yeah, and uh, and, and you know, and you did contribute some some very because uh, I, I it was funny I came across someone had commented on an old thread. Recently, here on on Google Plus, mm -hmm. and I saw that when I was uh, complimenting your um, works on GURPS Spirits, because that was always one of my one mm -hmm. of my favorites mm -hmm. of uh, the GURPS was that, and I really liked how you expanded the work of uh, C J Corella's original GURPS Voodoo and took mm -hmm. it in interesting directions. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that was a fun uh, a fun book. Uh, I'm really glad I, I did that. Most of my my um, Steve Jackson game stuff was for Pyramid uh, back in the day. I wrote a lot of articles um, for for Pyramid for a while because they were a great resource to to sell articles to. Um, but yeah, GURPS Spirits is my my one. I could I could check off, you know, wrote a GURPS book on my list. Um, so yeah, I was glad I glad that I did it. I you know it doesn't seem like uh, you know any more GURPS projects are likely in my future. But yeah, you never know. Yeah, this is true. Um, now, it, it probably is a, a sort of a um, um, that that particular book was sort of a, a I would imagine a, a in intersection of interests besides just the mm -hmm. gaming. You know, with some of the because um, I I don't know how I'm sure it is fairly well known that you are a, a neo pagan. So mm -hmm. um, that's, other, that's a poorly kept secret, if it is one. Yeah. Well, I mean, it might just be people don't care. That's, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, you know uh, that, and, and maybe like the um, the witch's book that you did for Green Ronin, which mm -hmm. took me forever to discover how to pronounce that company's name. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, the, those are the only times I think I've seen where those two sort of fields of of interest have sort of intersected in in your professional career. Is that something you've you've tried to, to keep apart or is it just something that no. doesn't really come up? Um, it, it's you know it, it shows up from time to time. I wouldn't say it's, those are the certainly not the only cases. I, I applied a lot. Of, well those are the ones that I've seen I guess right, I should say. Right. That's true. Uh, you know I, I certainly apply a fair amount of applied a fair amount of that to when I was writing stuff for, for um, Shadowrun and for Mage uh, and you know, other any other RPGs that had you know an intersection with um, you know pagan mythology uh, to one degree or another, um, and yeah, I mean, I it it shows up from time to time. Um, I I try to bring uh, a a certain amount of um, you know informed opinion. Uh, to those kind of topics, but I also try to keep it, you know, keep my keep aware of the fact that you know we're talking about fantasy fiction, you know, versus um, real world uh, spiritual and religious practices. So, um, you know, there's there's a fine line there. 
uh, as far as that goes. Um, you, 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 you want to be respectful um, of uh, real world practices and real world people and um, you know also produce you know a fun and interesting game you know so uh, I think that you know you, you can take things in a lot of different ways you know I think that um, Pathfinders approach to um, doing witches as a class uh, is is a lot of fun because they they take a much more sort of fairy tale um, approach to witchcraft, uh, and so they their their class is much more focused on uh, you know uh, poison apples and um, flying cauldrons and you, you, know, you can't really have too many flying cauldrons, right? You know, dancing huts and things like yeah. that. That's terrific because you know. That you know that kind of, of cultural mythology is part of what drives uh, you know fantasy games. So you know the the, the funny thing is that from a, a fantasy gaming respect, uh, you know, real world religion isn't necessarily all that exciting. No. Um, you know, there's very there's very little flash and bang you know to it. So. Right, which I would imagine also would make a lot, you know, trying to translate some of that into a gaming experience would make, it would, would be kind of difficult because, you know, it's not a, you know, there's a big flash of, of lightning and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, that sort of thing when, when doing, you know, workings like that, so. Right. But, um, so, um, let's see, after... You had the GURPS, and then um, what uh, What came in between that and, and your work for, for Green Ronin? You did more freelancing. And you also, one of the things that I know that probably doesn't get mentioned, or at least that I haven't seen mentioned a lot, is is your work as a novelist, because you've written a number <clears throat> of Shadowrun novels. I did. I, I, wrote, um, a, I wrote seven Shadowrun novels. Um, I've also written a... Um, Mech Warrior novel, and I wrote uh, a couple of. Uh, technically, I wrote three Crimson Skies novels, but only two were ever published. Uh, the third was um, mothballed uh, when Microsoft um, uh, took over the property. Uh, so yeah, I, I wrote a, uh, quite a fair amount of fiction uh, back in the day, and. Um, I, after the, the time I was, I was working on GURPS Spirits, was, um, I was still freelancing a fair amount. That was pretty close to the, the start of the, the sort of big D20 boom. Um, and I was doing a lot more. I was starting to do a lot more D20 work. And I was still doing stuff for um, uh, White Wolf, amongst others. I, I did a decent amount of stuff for White Wolf at that time. Um, is that something you would consider going back to one day if someone, you know, made an offer or, you know, if one of you, if like, you know, Green Running said, hey, we need Mutants and Masterminds novels, what do you think? You know, is that Writing fiction? Thing? Yeah, if, if the, the right opportunity came along, um, I certainly would consider it. The, the, difficulty, with, the difficulty with fiction um, is that it tends to be a fairly uh, long, sustained project. Um, and... You know, writing a novel is is maybe not quite as involved in the same way as, as producing an entire game, but it's pretty close um, in its own fashion. Uh, and so, it, it's a fairly significant uh, commitment of work, um, and it's one of those projects that that you know needs to you know I need to have a, a decent block of time available in order to do it. So it would have to be a project that would be worth putting aside that kind of time. Uh, in order to make it happen, but yeah, it's certainly a possibility. I did a um, a short story for a Shadowrun anthology a, a, a couple of years ago. Um, that was kind of a fun revisiting uh, of that process. Uh, so I would certainly have no objections to possibly doing more fiction. I just honestly haven't had had the time to work on any. <laughs> now, do do the processes uh, of you know the those two style, uh, forms of writing, you know, the game writing and the the fiction writing, do, do the two inform each other, or I mean, do you pick things up from one that you can apply to the other? Well, I think that I mean, I I think that you know, learning how to to write well applies to writing of all kinds, but I think that um, I just actually saw 
uh, a comment on Twitter that that uh, defined the difference between game writing and fiction writing as um, game writing is all about creating questions and fiction writing is all about providing answers. Uh, so I think that that's for me that's the big difference um, between the two. You know, game writing is all about creating a framework for our stories to exist, um, but being mindful of the fact that. Ideally, you're just creating a space for other people to make stories in uh, and giving them the raw materials to do that. Um, whereas fiction writing uh, is is actually producing the story and you know handing it to somebody as a complete entity, you know, for them to experience. Um, I found that that was one of the um, early on in, in my fiction writing. I found one of the difficulties I had was I was too coy as a, a fiction writer, and I had a tendency not to get to the point um, because um, my game writing experience had a, had a tendency to make me hedge my bets and write around things um, because because you want that vagueness uh, in the game context or at least that, that room for things to sort of breathe and, and for you know, uh, gamers to you know, look at that and see possibilities um, and not necessarily nail it down quite so specifically. Um, so I really needed to get more specific uh, in my fiction writing. Yeah, it's ironic because I, I actually, that was what I intended to be back when I was, you know, getting that fancy English degree in college. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I had someone ask me like a few months ago, hey, you want to write some fiction? I'm going, God, you know, that is so much work. <laughs> <laughs> So it's just it's yeah. amazing how much that that changes. Now, um, uh, something sort of related. Um, it, it and uh, obviously this this is something that's not a, a big secret. But you're you're a big comic fan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of hard that's to miss. Dozens, yeah. dozens of long boxes in my basement. Yeah. Have. Now, um, has has writing comics. Uh, uh, other than you know that thing that all of us want to do at the age of twelve, thinking it'd be cool to write, you know, mm -hmm. Iron Man or whatever, has yeah. has writing comics uh, ever been something you've considered or tried to to break into? Not really, surprisingly enough. Um, in spite of being a big fan of the the medium and the genre, uh, I never really sought out uh, trying to write comics professionally. Um, and maybe it's just uh, my you know, lack of familiarity with the, the process. Um, you know, I've read some comic scripts and things like that, but, you know, I've never actually written a comic script um, beyond, um, you know, a couple of one, one or two page things for Mutants and Masterminds uh, for game product. Um, so, you know, it's, it's never been anything that I've, I've really uh, sought out. I kind of wonder at this point if, you know, I'm better off in that regard um, just because I, you know, I can enjoy comics strictly for what they are as a, as a non-professional uh, who's not associated with them anyway. And I wonder if I would view them differently if I were writing them. So, I, you know, and I don't know, who knows, you know, and again, if the opportunity, you know, right opportunity came along, um, I, I would, you know, definitely give it a try. But it's a difficult field to break into um, unless you're uh, willing to um, move to New York and right, or, grovel you know, in front of editors a lot. Or you're, you're, you know, you've got a, a, an artistic partner who's willing to you know, sell yeah. something with you. you know? so, um, and um, I, you know, I'm, I'm you know, a terrible artist, so uh, I, would, I would strictly have to be on the, the keyboard side of, of you know, creating a comic book. So. Now, th this brings up a question, because you mentioned, um, you know, that you, you felt you would view comics differently if you became a comic writer. Mm -hmm. Do you view games differently since having become a professional? I do. I do. Um, it's, it's tough, you know, um, that, that it, it can be difficult when you do anything for a living. Um, or approach anything as a professional to step back and look at it strictly as a fan, um, just because it's it can be it can be tough to kind of separate that 
you know, um, professional, editorial, analytical mind uh, from the, the experience of it. So, you know, you, you, can, you can look at uh, a game and find yourself being like, ah, uh, well, this isn't bad, but, you know, I'm thinking in my head while I'm playing this about how I could redo this in a different way. Or I'm thinking about, wow, this is really great. Why didn't I think of this? You know, what else have I not thought of? How else could I, how could I apply this? And, you know, and you get distracted. And, you know, I, I recently wrote a, um, a blog um, column on Green Ronin's blog talking about, you know, what I call sort of the game designer's mind, uh, where, uh, you know, you can't, can get entirely away from the process of looking at everything from the, the, the position of a game design, you know, where I'll be watching a, a you know a movie or something like that, and my uh, partner will be like, "You're building, a, you're figuring out in your head how to do this in a game right now, aren't you?" <laughs> um, and I'll be like, "Yes," <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, now, you know. It, what uh, what are you, what is your partner's thoughts towards your your gaming? Uh, he he finds it cute. He finds it. <laughs> He, he's he is a, a tolerant non gamer um, who's who's always found um, my geeking out about games cute, but uh, beyond that he has no interest whatsoever. Well, it happens. Um, all right. Well, then I guess we can we can talk uh, about uh, your involvement with Green Ronin. Um, you started out freelancing with them before the long, arduous uh, uphill battle of eventually becoming a, a staff member. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what, was the, what was the first things you did for them? Uh, the very first Green Ronin project, uh, actually, the very first Green Ronin project I did was Witch's Handbook. Um, or no, I take that back. Um, Shaman's Handbook. Um, then Witch's Handbook. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was right at the the start of the the D twenty boom, and um, I you know was already um, I was already friends with um, Chris Premus and, and Nicole Lindrus, who were two of the uh, the three owners uh, of uh, Green Ronin, and, e. and um, you know we it's a small industry, and you know we all know each other, um, so. Uh, Green Ronin had just gotten started uh, with the, the launch of, of Death and Freeport right after uh, the release of the Player's Handbook for Third Edition, and they were you know, they were looking to you know do an aggressive line of of uh, you know D twenty uh, products under the uh, Open Game license, uh, and uh, so they. They, they were looking for proposals. Uh, I pitched them uh, the Shaman's Handbook uh, in <laughs> what Chris Kravis has referred to as the most professional proposal he's ever seen. <laughs> uh, and um, so they, they asked me to do that, and uh, I, I wrote that book. Um, that led to uh, Witch's Handbook, which um, Chris said I was, uh, you know, without any irony, the logical choice to write it. <laughs> Um, and um, so I was I, I was doing some D twenty stuff for them, and um, that led to um, Chris Chris and I talking about um, the manuscript for uh, Freedom City, which I had been working on off and on as a side project, um, and uh, the the potential of getting that published is what led to the discussion that that created Mutes and Masterminds. Yeah, Freedom City was originally. It wasn't that originally going to be part of the 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 San Angelo. It was. It was. It was originally going to be an East Coast sort of sister city to San Angelo, uh, and pretty much that um, the fact that it was on the East Coast, um, and the fact that it had been destroyed and rebuilt um, by what eventually became the uh, the Terminus invasion in uh, the final. Freedom City book um, were pretty much the only elements of the the original concept that survived. Um, but yes, the original manuscript was was intended to be a, a champions source book for uh, San Angelo. Um, that project uh, fell through, 
and the manuscript rights reverted to me. Um, and uh, I basically worked on it kind of in my spare time because it was a fun little project and I love superhero stuff. And so I was puttering with filling out all of the little corners and, and sidebars and sections of the, the city and its history and its characters. And um, I was I was talking with Chris um, about you know probably, you know various things and I, you know I said you know it's it's a shame that there are no um, superhero games around for me to pitch this source book to because I get this cool setting and there there is like nobody it was a superhero desert there was nothing in print yeah um, that was one of the times when Champions was in between companies yeah Champions was in between owners and sort of in legal limbo at that time uh, and. So, uh, you know, I was like, there's, you know, I didn't have anything to do with it. Um, and, you know, Chris suggested the idea of, you know, if we wanted to, to do it, because he thought it was a good product, uh, that we, you know, create a superhero game for it um, and, you know, publish it as the setting alongside it. And uh, it turned out that was a pretty smart idea. Three editions later. Right. <laughs> And a successful Kickstarter that you just had for yes. the for the anniversary. That's fifteen years. Uh, ten. 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 Sorry, sorry. We we try not to make anyone older here on this. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> so what what led you to? I mean, I'm sure there were probably some intermediary stages, but what what led you to sort of embracing um, you know the the open game content from third edition as the way to go with the superhero game? Well, uh, Chris Chris wanted it to be a D20 game right from the start uh, because D20 was, was pretty hot. Yeah. Uh, it was it was the next big thing. It was very popular. Um, the, um, everybody was, was sort of riding the, the cresting wave uh, of the popularity of third edition D&D. Uh, I, I was initially um, dubious about the idea Frankly, um, I, I had uh, spent a lot of time um, kind of getting away from the, the concept of, of class and level based, and um, I, you know, I had my smart ass period of the uh, you know early '90s where I, I would have derided anything D and D based as as ridiculously antiquated. Um, so uh, you know, I was I I, I was less than Certain that it was going to work, but um, when I when I looked at the the system resource document and I looked at the core mechanics of the game, um, you know the core mechanic uh, you know of of D twenty is is pretty simple and fairly elegant, and um, it was adaptable to to do some other things. You know, once I I moved aside the idea of having to stick to the canon of of Having hit points and having characters um, necessarily have you know discrete character classes, um, and so I came up with some modifications that I, I pitched uh, to Green Rooney and Chris liked them uh, enough to to green light things. Um, so I was able to to build a, a core system that I was pretty happy with uh, overall, um, particularly uh, handling uh, damage via saving throws rather than hit points and um, you know having a point based character creation system to handle all of the variety of powers the characters are going to have. Yeah the saving throw based damage I thought was was particularly good and it very I thought it was very um, a very elegant way to sort of simulate the source material. Yeah I thought it, it worked out pretty well in that regard uh, and people seem to enjoy it so that was that was a, a definite plus. I, I have since, you know, come to think that you know, hit point based superhero stuff could also work pretty well. My primary concern, in some ways, was less the hit points and more the the sheer number of uh, dice that would have been involved uh, in handling them properly. And I'm not a big fan of counting up a lot of dice uh, in my games. What's what turned me off on Shadowrun back in the day was uh, yeah. I, I tried I had a friend that ran first edition Shadowrun when we were in college and I think I had to roll like twenty dice on something and I was like this yeah. is this is more work than I'm really willing to put yeah. in. And, and Shadowrun was relatively easy because you're just counting you know up or down yeah. either, you know dies either success or not you don't have to actually add them all together. No. 
No, I I don't think I would have made it to a session if I'd had to do that much math. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it that that is another thing. I mean, it does. I mean, if you're going to use dice and superheroes, you're going to end up with a lot of dice in play, unless you go, you know, like yeah. the the methods that you did, or like you know, with the the classic uh, Marvel superheroes game, mm-hmm. where you know, I think they managed to fairly. Elegantly right. work their way around having to use humongous pools of, of dice for everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I would, I'd like to um, take that and lead into talk about icons, mm-hmm. but I'm going to have a, a step in between because I said before we started broadcasting that I want to talk about True 20. Right. So let's talk a little bit, bit about True 20. Um, well, I guess we can start with, with Blue Rose, mm-hmm. um, since that would where the game started, yeah. Um, now, um, Blue Rose was, I think, probably a fairly ballsy, um, thing to, to try. I mean, you know, it, I, I mean, I, I will say I'm a fan. I, I own all three of the books. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm not necessarily, I'm a fan of, uh, of, some of the elements of the genre, not necessarily some of the the exact authors at the time, but I I, mm-hmm. I do I do find the, the genre interesting, and um, but yeah, it was a lot of people seem to get kind of upset about you know mixing romance into role playing games. Well, and that damn know. and that damn deer. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know so much that it was the romance that concerned people. Um, it may have been some of the romantic notions, I suppose. Yeah, uh, yeah that would probably be more. About the game, you know. Um, yeah, well, Blue Rose. Um, you know, I, I, Blue Rose was, was intended to be, uh, you know, reflect a particular genre. Um, and I think that in that regard, we were pretty faithful to the, its sources of inspiration. Uh, I think that some people like that genre and some people don't like that genre uh, okay. for various reasons. And I think that people who don't care for that genre aren't going to care for Blue Rose. Uh, but uh, we were looking at the time um, for a, a different take on fantasy. Um, again, you know, the, the D20 open license was, was really big at the time, and uh, everybody was coming out with their d d campaign setting of one sort or another, but although there were some interesting takes, um, there was a lot of, you know, for lack of a better term, fairly vanilla fantasy, or fairly vanilla d d you know, right. to fantasy, to things. Um, and, you know, things had some their own twists to it, but it was, you know, D&D with whatever, D&D in space. Yeah, D&D, D&D with guns, yeah. D&D with guns, you know. Yeah. Um, and so we were looking to try and do a different take on, on, on the fantasy genre in general and looking at, well, what, uh, you know, so what fantasy literature hasn't really been explored uh, very much uh, in a game setting, and we came up with the, the romantic fantasy uh, stuff from Blue Rose, um, and uh, Blue Rose was uh, was initially conceived and begun before I I came aboard uh, full time at Green Ravine, but it became one of my first development projects uh, when I was uh, on staff and um, working with uh, John Sneed, who had come up with the initial uh, concept and done uh, a decent amount of the world design, and uh, Jerry John, Crawford. John uh, Sneed is a brilliant madman. Anyone who has ever hit, I mean, I mean that in a complimentary way. In anyone who you know, because I mean, we we've worked with him on on his you know his Eldritch Skies game, mm-hmm. and it's he he is a he is a fascinating person to interact with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's got John. John has has got um, endless ideas. Yeah. And um, Jeremy Crawford was was doing the the editing uh, duties. Uh, and this is, the, you know, uh, in the days before Jeremy's meteoric rise uh, through the ranks of uh, wizards, um, and uh, you know his his uh, time as a um, online star and numerous, you know, D and D next 
uh, podcasts and interviews. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we were we were working on the process of refining the setting and coming up with with um, uh, game rules to to fit it because the the initial draft uh, of the game was still way too D and D like in a lot of regards. And uh, so we we really wanted to to um, simplify it and uh, refine it because we we wanted Blue Rose to have some appeal outside of people who were already D and D players um, and who might have been you know f uh, fans of the genre, uh, but you know might uh, might have been turned off by D and D. So uh, we ended up uh, adapting. Uh, a number of ideas um, originally uh, developed for mutants and masterminds, and creating a kind of a, a hybrid uh, class and level based system that had a lot more flexibility to it. Um, a um, some material uh, inspired by a lot of my work on um, Psychic's Handbook, um, because psychic powers uh, were a big element of the genre uh, to begin with, uh, and um, you know, some of the, the streamlining that means masterminds applied to the system with things like uh, saving throw based uh, damage uh, and the like uh, to come up with a sort of a hybrid system. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, people who, uh, who strongly disliked the genre uh, that Blue Rose was about still found uh, something of value in the system itself. Uh, and uh, there was there was a certain uh, begrudging acceptance of you know well it's it's a it's a good game you know even though the <laughs> setting is terrible for all of the following reasons um, and so um, we uh, we figured that you know it was it was worth if if that was true um, that it was it was worth the idea of exploring you know doing something with the game itself. Uh, and seeing if the, the the rules engine had some some legs, uh, so we ended up breaking it out uh, into a, a separate uh, book. We did a an, sort of an ash can edition uh, of, the, the, PDF, of the game yeah. system for uh, Gen Con, um, uh, just to see you know how it would all uh, come together. Uh, and then we did a, a proper um, rule book launch uh, for it, and. Um, you know the the system had a lot of appeal. Um, I I think that I know, it's, well, it's a fun system. You know, it's mm -hmm. it it's it's very. I I found a, I came into a conversation here on Google Plus recently where uh, it was being talked about, and um, a lot of people were comparing it to some of the the work done um, with some of the 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 OSR designers. And you know stuff like you know the um, you know like Labyrinth Lord and and mm -hmm. and Swords and Wizardry because of the um, you know just the more kind of simplified mm -hmm. um, approach to it. Not necessarily that it was you know an old school kind of game, but it just that it sort of had that that similar sort of zeitgeist to it. I guess would mm -hmm. would be. Um, mm -hmm. A good thing, and and I, you know, I kind of agreed because I, I, I think that was one of the reasons why True Twenty appealed to me at the time so much was because I was just getting to a point where it was like, oh my god, I can't handle all of this, you know. Right. You know, two, three hours later, we we fought one orc, and right. you know that sort of thing, and I, I really liked the fact that you know, that that True Twenty kind of took the bones of all of that and then said, you know what. It doesn't have to be difficult. Well, that was the the primary idea behind it, um, and you know that that certainly was when you were starting to see the initial uh, results of uh, sort of the the bloat brought about by the the open game license in terms of uh, just layering endless amounts of options on the core um, third edition. System, you know, where you know they're when people were on their third book of feats, yeah, and uh, you know their their second book of prestige classes, and you know, two uh, thousand and one sailor feats, right? You yeah. know, it, it started to get to the point where the the system was was starting to groan, you know, yeah. of all of the that complexity, 
And so I, I think there was certainly an appeal uh, to a simpler, streamlined uh, system that you know, didn't require quite as much uh, prep work in terms of putting, putting together a character or putting together a game. So, um, yeah, there, there was a definite appeal to it. I think that in some regards, uh, True 20's downfall uh, was the, the separation of the, the system from a clear uh, context. Um, I think that some, you know, universal systems do okay on their own, um, but I don't think, I think in some regards, True 20 wasn't universal enough yeah. Uh, for those you know types of really true universal system purists, um, yet um, was div sufficiently divorced from any setting context that it didn't really have very many hooks in that yeah. regard either. Um, so there were I mean there were a few early adopters, uh, and we provided a lot of sample settings, uh, but they were small, understandably due to space constraints and kind of sketchy. Uh, so, uh, you know, things just didn't really quite gel as far as that went. Um, let's, I guess at this point, let's go into talking about your, your other simplified uh, game, which I, I brought up right before this, and uh, Icons, mm -hmm. which is sort of, I remember when um, you were posting sort of the initial versions of this back on your website, um, what was it you were calling it then? I was going to um, refer to it as the superlative. Yes. Um, and um, it was yeah. it was sort of this unholy um, marriage of of old uh, Marvel superheroes and fudge and mm -hmm. other things, and it was a fun system. And I mean, and obvious, it still is as as icons. And mm -hmm. um, what? Um, what led to kind of going from the, you know, I just have these kind of ideas about stuff I might like to do that you had posted online mm -hmm. and it going to into icons? Well, I, um, yeah, I had started out icons like a lot of things. Started out as, you know, just one of those sort of, you know, scratch it down in a notebook ideas um, where uh, I was, you know, knocking around a, a concept and said, hey, you know, this um, sort of thing was, um, I noticed the similarity of the descriptive terms uh, of, of um, fudge and Marvel superheroes, and I was playing around with some of the, the scaling and other elements uh, there. And it was one of those, those things that just sort of sat um, you know, half finished on my website and you know, in my notebooks and such that I uh, played around with off and on. And um, what really you know brought it uh, brought it together was like a lot of projects was having a deadline. <laughs> um, I, um, I I played around with the idea a lot and you know scratch notes and made revisions and played around with drafts uh, and things like that. And um, then uh, um, Gareth Skarka over at Adam Entertainment um, mentioned uh, in some online forum uh, or mailing list, I'd honestly forget which, um, that he was, he was looking to do a, um, a, a simpler sort of streamlined superhero system <clears throat> that uh, partook of a lot of the sort of old school superhero games of the uh, the late 70s and early 80s, and he, you know, described a number of things, and I was like, oh, wow, it's pretty much the thing I'm doing. Um, and so I, I got in touch with him, and I said, you know, it's funny that you're looking to publish uh, a game like that, Gareth, because I'm pretty much writing a game like that. Um, and so we got to talking. I showed him some of my initial drafts. Um, he said, well, you know, do you want to cut a deal to publish this thing? And I said, sure. We, we worked out uh, the, the details, and nothing sharpens the mind like a, like a deadline. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know, one, when we had a signed agreement and I had a date stamped on my calendar that said this is when it needs to be done, um, you know, that, that motivated me to, to take a lot of stuff that had been sort of you know, vaguely focused and, and bring it you know, more sharply into focus and make it happen. 
So, um, and uh, that's that's what finally got me to to finish the thing. Um, that that and the fact that I I um, was was really fond of of icons. Uh, random character generation. That was another one of those <laughs> artifacts of my early um, gaming experience that, that you know, more mature, quote unquote, you know, uh, you know, 90s me you know, would have, you know, poo-pooed as, you know, ridiculously antiquated, you know, oh, any game that has random character creation so behind the state of the art, I would never play such a game. Um, those sorts of things, uh, but then you know I looked back very fondly on um, my experience uh, with my friends. You know, back in the day when I was first playing Gamma World, uh, of you know rolling on those mutation tables to, to create characters, and just the weird, wacky stuff we would come up with, uh, and the same experience that we had um, playing first playing uh, Villains and Vigilantes. Uh, where we did the same thing, where we were rolling up characters, and everybody was was you know coming up with these weird powers, and everybody was you know rolling the dice, going, "Come on, really cool power!" Yeah, yeah. Or, or uh, the the old powers, or the old Ultimate Powers book from Marvel, where oh, you yeah. would, where you would roll a half angel, half cyborg with you know right. ice powers. Right. Exactly. That was the, <laughs> the mother of all random creation tables, you know. Uh, so, you know, and I just, that was, it was fun. And so um, one of the, the best parts about playtesting icons, especially um, when I was playtesting it at cons, uh, was just sitting down, you know, with everybody at the table and saying, okay, we're going to make characters. Um, and just having everybody roll up characters um, and just seeing, you know, what they would you know, come up with uh, in terms of the stories and motifs uh, to go with these characters. Was was pretty awesome, really. Um, now you recently um, took over full ownership of of uh, icons, and and you've started uh, sort of publishing for yourself now. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, you just had a successful Kickstarter for your first supplement for for icons, which yes. is going to be ironically the Powers book, right. <laughs> Um, can can you talk a little bit about that and you know what uh, what sort of went into the you know what you were looking for when you when you sat down to design this first thing for it once you owned it and realized crap I have to. <laughs> um, well, basically, uh, great power kind of came out of uh, the fact that you know one of the every, every game has has its you know, has its thing um, that is is cool to to have more of, um, you know, one degree or another. Uh, for me, with um, D and D, it was always magic items. Um, although monsters are also another big one. Um, you know, uh, I could I could have you know eight hundred books of magic items for D and D, and I'd be you know still reading more of them. Uh, you know, and uh, with with superhero games, it's powers. You know, I mean, the the one of the big reasons to play a superhero game is to have cool powers. Um, so, I mean, in, in some ways, it's it's arguably what superhero games are about. Um, you know, being a hero is really you know in many ways what superhero games are about. But the powers are one of the things that really make them fun. So, um, I, you know, I, I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about, you know, powers uh, for a game like Icons. And I also wanted to uh, think about the idea of expanding on powers for a game like Icons without necessarily overcomplicating uh, the powers for a game like Icons. Um, you know, I had done a lot of power design for um, Mutants and Masterminds, and in particular, one of the things that inspired Great Power was working on the um, Power Profiles series for Mutants and Masterminds, which was basically a weekly look at a different kind of superpower, you know, every week, and all these worked examples of of how those powers uh, would work, um, and. Uh, Mutes and Masterminds had a particular way of, of handling that, um, but doing that process 
you know, made me think about, you know, how cool it is to have all these power examples, and they can be very inspirational and spark some interesting ideas. Um, so I started playing around with a similar idea for, for icons in its own particular fashion. Um, and that's, and Great Power is pretty much the manuscript that, that resulted from that. Are there a lot of random tables? There are quite a few random tables. Um, I, my, my kind of rule of thumb in icons is if I can find a way to put a random table in there, I will. Um, so uh, pretty much any instance in the book where there's a, a choice to be made, uh, there's usually a table and a, a caveat that says, or pick whatever you want. Um, but, you know, I like to make the option if people want to roll for it, they can. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of random tables. But, um, what, what was, what was uh, for you in, in the new book, what was the most interesting uh, power to write up? Gosh, um, most interesting power to write up. I, I think that um, certainly doing some of the, the, you know, the meta powers uh, that have a lot of breadth to them uh, is interesting. Um, but, uh, you know, I also really enjoyed writing up some of the kind of oddball uh, powers uh, for, the, for the book and just coming up with, you know, um, ways to cram you know, every, to get as much mileage out of a fairly, it's a relatively small book, it's only um, 107 pages right now, it'll probably be uh, 128, 130 when it's all done. Um, but, um, you know, just kind of cramming every little last idea into it. Um, so, you know, it was, it was things like um, finishing my first draft and then, you know, hauling out my um, you know, uh, guide to the Marvel Universe, and flipping through the whole thing and going, okay, are there any powers that I missed? Um, you know, and being like, oh, pheromone powers, did I do those? And looking, going, okay, yes, I did a pheromone modifier for mind control. I can apply that over here to motion control. That's pretty much covered. And then I would, you know, flip on to the next, you know, few pages, and I'd be like, oh, you know, detachable head, did I do that? You know, you know, detachable limbs is really an underappreciated power. That's a very underappreciated power. Yeah. You know? um, so that was a fun part of the process. Um, and, you know, and just, you know, going through. Um, when Eric Mona and I were first working on the first draft of uh, the first edition of Mutants and Masterminds, we were applying what we referred to as the Legion of Superheroes test um, to the powers chapter uh, that basically said if, if the powers chapter couldn't handle every member of the Legion of Superheroes, it was incomplete in some fashion. So uh, we were kind of focusing on that idea as well. That's actually probably not a bad test because not only was there a, a, a good spread of powers because there were so damn many of them, but there were some really weird-ass powers. <laughs> it, on all powers. Yeah, like, you know, like Matter Eater Lad, being able to eat right. anything. Right, and and the, the bouncing power, which is also in, in great yeah. power. So, you want to play Bouncing Boy, you can. Which I'm sure there is a huge demand for people to, to sure. play Bouncing Boy. Right. Um, <coughs> now, when... Um, what uh, when when uh, roughly is, can we expect uh, uh, great power? Well, uh, the, I'm working on um, incorporating all the playtest feedback uh, into the manuscript right now. Uh, Dan Hauser is hard at work on all of the art uh, for the book, so I plan on uh, pretty much handing everything off uh, to uh, Daniel Solis, who's doing the layout work uh, by the end of January. So. I am hoping, you know, should all go according to plan, um, that uh, we'll be releasing the, uh, we'll have the final PDF uh, probably by the end of February, um, and then it'll just be a matter of um, printing the books, so people may see printed books as soon as the end of March, I would guess. Now, uh, what, what sort of um, rough future things do you have in mind uh, now that you're in charge of, of icons, do you plan on an eventual um, uh, like second edition of the the core book? A lot of people ask that, and I'm still thinking about it. Um, I'm uh, I don't know. Uh, I I I need to look at how seriously 
necessary or how I, if I'm going to do that, that's one of those things I really want to do right um, in the sense that, um, you know, there, there's a strong game designer impulse, at least for me. Uh, I think that if, if it were up to me, there would never be such a thing as a finished game. The only thing that ever keeps me, the only thing that ever ensures I finish a game is the fact that there's a deadline where I have to hand it off to somebody else. Um, otherwise, I'd probably keep working on it forever. Um, and I keep fiddling with it and changing things and moving things around. And you know, sometimes I you know, strongly suspect, and I know this because I've done it in my extended home brew playtests of things, where I will, I will go on this long arc of, you know, completely discarding this thing and being like, oh, this idea was rubbish. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to completely do this other thing. You know, I'd work on it and refine it and refine it and play around with it and change it and shift it, and it would come all the way around. And I'd find myself back at the original idea I'd discard it and go, oh, you know what? Actually, that's not so bad. You know? Well, and, and now that, you know, you're going to be the, the publisher as well as the, well, you are the publisher as well as being the designer, um, you, you don't really have the the sort of external force of someone going, you know, hey, we got you know. Yeah, yeah, I have the, I have the very dangerous, uh, well, yeah, my deadlines are, are largely self-imposed, uh, which is one problem. Um, I also have a very dangerous factor that there's very few people who get to tell me no. Um, <laughs> Which you know can can be a good thing at times, but can also be somewhat detrimental. So um, you know, uh, fortunately, things with with great power have worked out well in the sense that uh, Kickstarter has provided an excellent amount of accountability uh, in the sense that I promised to deliver something, um, and uh, the it's also provided an excellent opportunity to get feedback um, by providing all the backers with the the initial draft uh, of the book. Um, so that I've been able to, to get some great um, you know, playtest information and just great you know, read-throughs of the, of the manuscript that give me a much better sense on how to refine some things. So I think it'll be a much stronger product uh, because of that. Yeah, I think that's... <coughs> excuse me. And I, I think it's something that yeah, um, uh, Green Ronin in general has been fairly good about with doing like their early PDF releases of things, mm -hmm. too, is mm -hmm. that a lot of things that you know, might have got, might have slipped through the cracks, and then you know, once you got the book out, it was like, oh my god, what the hell was I thinking? Right. So kind, yeah. kind of, kind of got caught, you know, by other people reading and playing and going, ooh, this, this, this is a neat sounding idea, but it just doesn't yep. really work. Yeah. No matter, it's it's an absolute truth of publishing that errata happens, and um, there, no matter how many people you have proofread a book, there's absolutely no substitute for having hundreds and hundreds of people poring over your newly released book, um, you know, because you just get that many times more, yeah. um, you know, eyes on it, especially fresh eyes on it, um, because I can tell you, you know, anyone who's worked in the production or editorial side of things, you know, by the time you've, you've looked at a uh, laid out book for the fifth or sixth time, you're you're not even sure what you're looking at uh, yeah. at that point. Um, so uh, yeah, having the opportunity to early, early release um, electronic uh, versions of the book uh, that you know can be you know updated you know just like that um, has provided a great opportunity to get early release feedback uh, from uh, the the user side uh, and. You know, then you know, refine and improve the the book that much more before you finally you know get the the lever to send it off to print. Um, I guess we can sort of wrap up at this point. I've I've uh, had you uh, talking long enough. Uh, what are, what are some of the next couple, uh, few things uh, coming up for Steve Kenson? Well, right now uh, I'm working, obviously, working pretty uh, hard on getting the Great Power Manuscript uh, into its final form. Um, I'm working on um, the uh, final pieces for the um, uh, Mutants and Masterminds Anniversary Edition. Um, we've got uh, some, some retrospective essays and um, some um, updated versions of some of the classic characters. 
uh, that uh, we're going to include uh, as well. And um, then it's it's um, working um, on some of Green Ravine's new um, uh, lines for mutants and masterminds over this year. Uh, we've got a new series coming up called Gadget Guides, uh, which follows on the very successful uh, power profiles um, and is a look at uh, gear, equipment, and devices of all kinds um, for the, the line. Uh, there are a lot of requests um, for those kinds of things uh, for power profiles. And we, uh, John Lighthouser, the M&M &M developer, and I realized that, in fact, there were really too many of them um, to, to do just as uh, power profiles, and we were better off to, to, to look at breaking them out into their own uh, separate series. So we're doing that. Uh, we've also got uh, a new uh, series coming up that complements our um, Wildcards uh, source book for Mutants and Masterminds um, called um, uh, Scare Sheets, uh, which is Scare is the, uh, see if I get it right, Senate Committee on uh, ACE Activities or something like that. Uh, <laughs> which um, is the, the fictional organization uh, in the federal government in the wild cards world that handles um, all of the, the wild carders. And um, we're doing um, profiles and write-ups of characters from the new series of, of wild cards books um, that uh, have come out in the last few years uh, that have, have uh, picked up the series again. Um, so uh, characters from uh, what's called the, the committee triad, which was the, the first... Uh, three books uh, primarily, um, and we're going to be doing those uh, very similar to the, the threat reports uh, that we did uh, earlier for Mutants and Masterminds and provide, uh, each one is going to focus on a character, uh, provide background, um, M&M3 stats, and um, all the information you need to use the, the character in a game. So in addition to being really great stuff for uh, Wild Cards fans, there are going to be a lot of interesting takes on some you know, lower powered, but not always. Um, characters uh, for Mutants and Masterminds as well. Very cool. I love the the wild card books. So I, yeah. I was I was glad to see that that came came back around to uh, an RPG again when, when you guys did it for for Mutants and Masterminds. Yeah, it was it was I was uh, I'm a big fan of the series, so it was it was it was really uh, pretty awesome to to be able to work with the um, the. Um, the authors and uh, to be able to work with the characters in the setting. So, well, um, thank you very much uh, for talking with me tonight. Um, where, if people want want to follow, watch, or contact you online, uh, I'm sure somebody wants to watch you in your hoodies. So you know, <laughs> um, people can uh, catch up with me. My website is stevekenson.com um, and. People can find me on Facebook and on Google Plus and on Twitter, um, and um, they can usually reach me at uh, stevekenson at me.com, uh, my primary email. So uh, folks can drop me a line anytime. All right. Thank you very much for talking with me tonight, Steve. Thanks a lot.